Okay, good afternoon everyone. Um, what I'd like to talk to you today about is current and future therapies for type 2 diabetes and uh, as you can see uh, I'm uh, living on the sixth floor where my lab is of the uh, Alberta Diabetes Institute pictured here with leaves on the trees, no snow on the ground so it does happen in Edmonton. Um, and I'm going to focus on the pharmacology of type 2 diabetes. Many of you here in this room may be type 2 diabetic and take medications. Who here takes medications for type 2? Okay, so a number of you here will be familiar with some drug names I'm going to mention. I'd like to just delve into what those drugs do. You might be told uh, a certain drug, it lowers your blood sugar levels, but you'd like to know why. So I'm going to tell you a little bit more details of how those drugs work, and then I'm going to touch on a few things that uh, drugs in the pipeline undergoing clinical trials as well as future directions for drug research for type 2 diabetes. My own research is focused on islet function um, with respect to pharmacology, so how drugs work on the islet, and I'll tell you a little bit about some of my latest research later on. Okay? So let's look at some of the causes of type 2 diabetes. Okay? First of all, you'll see insulin resistance at the top there. Okay. Dr. Arya Sharma was mentioning insulin resistance comes before uh, any dysfunction or abnormal secretion of insulin from the islets, from the beta cells. Okay. And insulin resistance, there's a number of factors for that, largely diet and lifestyle choices that we make. Partially genetics, I'll show you some evidence suggesting for insulin resistance at least it's not genetics. Okay, um, and what may happen during changes in diet and lifestyle is you get abnormal beta cell function. So if you see on the right here, we get um, abnormal beta cell function, which leads to eventually insulin deficiency. So the insulin produced does not overcome that insulin resistance. Okay, so that leads to high blood sugar levels and type 2 diabetes. If we look on the left, we can have normal beta cell function, um, which leads to increased insulin secretion that can overcome or partially overcome the insulin resistance, so you get near normal blood sugar levels, and you may be what's known as pre-diabetic. And there's probably at least as many pre-diabetics out there as there are people with type 2 diabetes. It's just their pancreas is still secreting enough insulin to overcome the insulin resistance. Okay. So there are many people out there who are at increased risk of developing full-blown type 2 diabetes, and we call that pre-diabetes. The key factor is here is you won't develop diabetes unless you don't produce enough insulin. So it's usually an effect of the beta cells not being able to produce enough insulin to overcome the insulin resistance. Another factor which may predispose you between having normal beta cell function and abnormal beta cell function is your genes, okay? Um, I know so your genetic background is very important for that. Unfortunately, we can't always pick our parents, right? Um, so we are, at birth, predisposed to that genetic set we have, okay? So you may well, through your genetics, be predisposed to it. It doesn't mean that you will definitely get diabetes if you have differences in your genes, but it just means that in combination with diet and lifestyle, it may predispose you to it, make it more likely to happen. Okay. So for an example for that, let's look at some genetic risks in type 2 diabetes. Ignore some of the funny names here. But what's happened in the last decade or so is we've been able to sequence the human genome so we know what the complete human genome is. Okay. And now we've reduced the cost so that we can do thousands of patients looking at the human genome. And what we found over the last decade or so is that a number of genes, these genes make proteins which are expressed in the different tissues. 
you can see in the middle where the pancreas is, there's lots of gene names compared to the liver, skeletal muscle, and the fat tissue, the adipose tissue in the brain. So the ones on the outside are responsible for insulin resistance, but the one in the middle for the pancreas, that's for insulin secretion. So you can see immediately your genetic risk is probably because of abnormal beta cell function. That's where most of your genetic risk will lie, okay? Not through insulin resistance. The other factor in here is what Norm Belay was mentioning is you can take drugs and they do work. So if we look at a placebo and the cumulative index, so over time, the more likely you are to develop diabetes, the placebo, so the control group, Okay, then we take metformin, which is the most commonly used anti-diabetic drug. Yes, it reduces your risk. But look what happens when you do lifestyle as well. Okay, even greatly reduce your risk. So it's important that if you do take medications, that you also change your lifestyle as well, and you'll get a much more beneficial effect on lowering blood sugar levels and preventing some of the complications of diabetes. So it's not just a question of my doctor gave me pills, it's my doctor gave me pills and I should also change my lifestyle to improve the way that those drugs work as well. Okay, so that's important. But I, what I will talk to you about now is really looking at the pharmacology. What are the strategies we can use in type 2 diabetes? Okay. The idea is to achieve glucose homeostasis. So when Dr. Corbett was mentioning keep that blood sugar levels in between those two green lines very nicely tightly controlled. That's what we want to do. We don't want to have glucose spikes. That's what causes tissue damage. So we can do that in a number of ways. We can have drugs that in it, uh, increase insulin secretion. These would be the sulfonylureas and the phenylalanine analogs. I'll mention some of those in a moment. A newer class of drugs which just come out are the GLP-1 mimetics and the DPP-4 inhibitors. So these have been out for about three years now. Some of you may have heard of them. You might be actually be prescribed them. Uh, and they have a multiplicity of effects. We also have drugs that decrease insulin resistance or increase insulin sensitivity, so that insulin produced is more effective on those tissues. And we also have drugs that directly lower blood sugar levels independent of insulin. Those would be the biguanides. So that would be metformin that many of you have heard of. Okay. Uh, we have the alpha glucosidase inhibitors and a newer class, the SGL2 inhibitors, which are undergoing clinical trials. So I'll go through some of these for you. Okay. So what are the sulfonylureas? They're an orally active group of drugs. And they come from sulfonamides, which are antibiotics. So this class of drugs was discovered around the Second World War. And they found that in clinical tests of these drugs, some of these antibiotic agents, ca agents caused very, very fast lowering of blood glucose levels. So they were quite good antibiotics, but they're also very good at lowering blood sugar levels. So we didn't know how they worked, but they engineered the drugs so that they maintained their ability to lower blood sugar levels and they weren't antibiotics anymore. And these drugs were then, this class of drugs, the sulfonylureas, were born. So it's been used in diabetes actually probably for nearly 50 years now. Okay, but it wasn't until about a decade or so ago that we actually knew what the heck they did. We just used them because they worked. But now we know how they work, and I'll tell you about that in a moment. The problem to these is that they can cause postprandial hypoglycemia. So in other words, if you take them, they may lower your blood sugar levels too low. So you can come a, a diabetic coma from them, okay? Um, these drugs don't care what your blood sugar levels are like. They could be high or low, they'll still cause insulin secretion. So you can cause hypoglycemia, okay? So exactly how they work, okay? Uh, in this cartoon here, we see a beta cell from an islet. This is a picture of a human islet in the corner. Okay? And at low plasma glucose levels, these cells are inexcitable. So they haven't got electrical activity in them. Okay? But what happens if you can measure that, and this is what I do in my lab, we can stick very small glass electrodes onto individual cells, and at the bottom here, we can measure electrical activity here. Okay, this is a recording taken from my lab. 
we can measure that activity. Okay? But when high glucose happens, you get a change in metabolism. We depolarize the cell membrane, which means we allow calcium to come in and insulin secretion to occur. Okay? And if you measure that electrical activity, it's almost like a neuron. Okay? It's just as much slower neuron. So electrical activity drives um, brain activity, the muscle contractility, but we're looking at a slower time scale here. We get these spikes here, and every time we get these spikes occurring, we get a puff of insulin coming out. We change metabolism again, back to low glucose, we lose excitability. So that's how they work. Okay? Um, you can see on, this, on the panel on the right, we have the sulfonylureas and the glinide drugs, and they act by closing a protein called the KATP channel, and they promote insulin secretion. So that's where those drugs work. So we now know exactly where that class of drugs work. So which drugs do we have on the market right now? We have tolbutamide, which is one of the first ones used, uh, glibenchamide, a gliburide, diabeta, chlorpropamide. I don't think we can get this one in Canada, but I know it's still prescribed in Europe quite a lot. Uh, they are very effective in majority of patients, but if you have renal complications, they're not indicated. And now we have some new derivatives, such as glipizide and glicozide, glucotrol and dimicron, okay, which are also very useful. Okay. Anyone here using sulfonylureas as treatment? Okay. Um, anyone using glyburide? Okay, glicozide? Glyburide, okay. It's actually interesting to know that the most common ones in Alberta are glyburide, diabeta, and glicozide, dimicron. Okay. And I will make a suggestion in a moment that if you're on glyburide, you should talk to your doctor about going to glicozide, um, just because I think longer-term health is slightly better with glicozide, and studies are now showing it's probably as good, if not better, than glyburide. Okay. They are very effective at lowering glucose levels, but they can cause postprandial hypoglycemia. There's an issue that's being studied right now is that they have, may have cardiovascular side effects. Their target, the KATP channel, is also expressed in smooth muscle, so it might cause hypertension in your, in your vessels. It's also expressed in the heart, so it may cause damage to the heart if you close them. Okay. Glycoside has been shown to be more selective for the beta cells than it is for the heart. Okay. Now, glycoside is off, um, it can be prescribed as easily as glyburide, and it actually accounts for about 50% of those sulfonyl prescriptions in Alberta. So it's certainly an option to see whether glycoside would work better. It, may, it will give you the same effectiveness as glyburide, but it may not have some cardiovascular complications. Again, that's just a feeling from the literature. There are a number of ongoing studies which are looking at that right now to see whether that is the case. Okay. A couple of other ones here. Um, the phenylalanine analogs or the glinides, they're called. These really are very good at taking just prior to a meal, and they cause insulin secretion right when you need it at the time of a meal. Okay? And they work very well. They're short-acting and readily metabolized in the liver, um, and no side effects are documented. So they're really good for stopping those glucose spikes after a meal. So if you're just using sulfonylureas prior to a meal, then these drugs may be a better alternative for doing that task. If you have problems with fasting blood glucose levels, then the sulfonylureas may be better drug to use because these are very, very fast acting, but um, they're metabolized quickly, so their effectiveness wears off within about 30 minutes of using them. Okay? So here's an interesting um, target. GLP-1, glucagon-like peptide 1. Um, now being established as an excellent target as an anti-diabetic uh, drug. So what happens is when you ingest food from the gut, GLP-1 is secreted. And what it does, it has a number of effects. It increases satiety, so you feel less hungry, so you feel full quicker. It delays gastric emptying. 
And on the pancreatic islet, it stimulates insulin secretion. It also increases the beta cells to proliferate to make more beta cells. Uh, reduces beta cell death or apoptosis. And it reduces glucagon secretion. So that's the counter hormone to insulin. Okay. In other words, what it does is it improves your glycemic control and reduction in body weight. The catch to that is that it's a peptide. It's an amino acid sequence, much like insulin, but there are no orally available drugs which target like insulin does. Okay. So these are peptides, and they have to be administered via subcutaneous injection. So in the top corner, you can see these pens for exanatide, which is called bieta. Okay. It's a synthetic version found in the saliva of the Gila monster. Now you're thinking, what the heck am I going to do injecting salivary gland excretions from um, a lizard which lives in the desert of Arizona and Mexico? Well, that's really interesting because what it does is its lizard does not eat for weeks and months at a time. But then it suddenly catches a desert rat or whatever, and it secretes hormones like exendin, and that causes its own pancreas to proliferate and become very big so that it can absorb an, all the energy from that meal. Okay? So it's sort of a way it's helping its body do that. Okay? Um, so derivatives of this, don't, you don't have to keep a pet healer monster at home or anything, get it to bite you, it's okay. You can use uh, these pens and you can um, inject yourself once daily with bieta. There's another one called liraglutide, which basically um, is a similar effect. These are very fast-acting drugs, but they're also metabolized very quickly, and they're broken down in the body by something called DPP4, which is an enzyme it breaks down GLP-1. Okay? So it doesn't last very long in the bloodstream. Okay? Um, so those are the couple of the main ones. There are other drug companies now who are looking at other derivatives, tasobaglutide, albiglutide, and there's a few other ones here going through trials. So it seems as though many drug companies are getting their own GLP-1 analog. But the downside of this in all of these is that it's a, an injection. Maybe once daily, it can be up to once weekly, but it's still an injection one would have to take. Um, there are some GI disturbances with it. For example, exendin, many patients can't stay on it because it makes them feel sick. Patient compliance may be an issue as well. So um, I don't like needles. I don't think I'd like to be injecting myself or don't have to. So maybe there's a scope there to develop an oral medication to have the same effect. And that's one area in my lab we're trying, interested in looking at whether we can stimulate GLP-1 secretion from the gut orally, because for me it makes perfect sense. If you take a drug orally, the first tissue it hits is the gut. So can we stimulate GLP-1 secretion? That's an area of interest in my laboratory. These ones here, has anyone been prescribed Genuvia? No? Okay, it's only come on the market in the last few years. What this does, it prevents the breakdown of your own GLP-1. So in other words, it stays in your bloodstream for longer. Okay. That's all it does. It inhibits the, the enzyme which breaks it down. Orally active, very good drug. Citagliptin is one of them. Vildagliptin and saxagliptin are just different derivatives of this molecule, all orally available, and um, seem to be effective there. Um, DPP4, which is the target of these drugs, also breaks down lots of other proteins in the body, so there may be some side effects associated with it as well. So it's not, the, it's not a perfect drug, it's just a different way of doing it, and it is very effective. Okay? So you may hear of these ones here. So that would be the, the um, DPP4 inhibitors, Genuvia, Galvis, and uh, Saxagliptin are the other ones which are coming through. So a number of those will be on the market soon, and you may come across those. So what about insulin sensitizers? These are the agents that reduce insulin resistance. Um, these are PPAR alpha or gamma ligands. The alpha ones are called phenofibrate. 
and the ones you most likely have heard of are called pioglitazone, rosaglitazone, or the TZ DEETS. Um, it took me about a year to pronounce what TZD is, but it thiazolinodiones, and I can say it without, without stopping now. So the thiazolinodiones help the bodies use that insulin better. Okay, you may see them called TZDs, but the way drug companies name them, they always name them like the same thing. So the last few parts of the, the word, like glitazone, it's a TZD. Okay, same with all drugs. So what they do is they target the fat tissue, the skeletal muscle, and the liver, and increase its sensitivity to insulin. So the insulin works better. Okay. You might be prescribed an insulin sensitizing agent, such as this, as well as the sulfonylurea, because then you're increasing insulin secretion, and then that insulin secreted will act better on the tissue. So you have a drug combination. So it's, you can take more than one drug, usually in a formula together, which will have a very beneficial effect, okay? Here's a new drug um, coming on the market. Um, just finishing clinical trials. This is a sodium glucose transporter um, inhibitor, and I'll explain how it works. Very good at lowering plasma glucose levels. What it does, it increases um, sugar levels in your urine. So you just pee more sugar, okay? So it clears more sugar from the bloodstream as it's processed through the kidney. Okay. Um, as you can imagine, you're peeing more sugar, so there's more sugar for the bacteria to eat in your urine, so you may be more prone to urinary tract infections. Okay. But nevertheless, it is effective and very few side effects. So how it acts, this is part of dissection of the kidney here, and what it does is that where this cross is here, it prevents reabsorption of glucose from the urine, so you actually pee more, pee more sugar in your urine, and that's the target of it, okay? The bigonides, the most common one you've probably heard of is metformin. Its mechanism of action is independent of insulin. This one is the number one prescribed drug for diabetes. Yes, it is effective well tolerated and is a first line oral treatment. Okay. So you may get metformin with a sulfonylurea or metformin with an insulin sensitizing agent, one of the TZDs. You may be prescribed two drugs. Okay. Very effective drug. These ones, glucose, precos, um, acarbos, basically what it does, it prevents absorption of um, sugars from the digestive tract. In other words, it stops you taking up the sugars into your bloodstream, okay? The downside to that is that you've got more sugars in your GI tract, which bacteria love, so you tend to get a bit gassy and tend to may have diarrhea from it. So it actually does conform to changes people's, if they're on this drug, they tend to stay away from carbohydrates a bit more because if they eat carbohydrates, then they have to leave the room much more often, okay? So... Um, Good drug, very good at lowering plasma glucose levels because it prevents the absorption, but that glucose has got to go somewhere and the bacteria in your gut love that, okay? So what about future therapies then? We have glucokinase inhibitors. It's an enzyme found in the liver and pancreas. It controls how the beta cells sense glucose. And there are a couple of drugs here which, lead, which cause increases in activity of this enzyme and have been tested in animals and in phase two clinical trials right now. So that's another drug that may be important to, to come through. A couple of other ones here, the sirtuins. Um, these are enzymes discovered into research into lifestyle and aging. You may have heard of resveratrol. I've got a picture of it here. Um, it's found in red wine. Um, I will never discourage anyone from drinking red wine, but in animal models where they've used resveratrol in diets, they've seen the animals live twice as long, so mice live twice as long, and they don't get diabetes if they're put in a high-fat diet, if they take resveratrol. Now, the upside is, is it's found in red wine. The downside is you'd have to drink 100 bottles a day. Okay. So probably not a good plan to do that, although you probably won't remember it anyway. Um, 
But you can, there are clinical trials going on now with pure resveratrol. And you may have seen in the health food stores resveratrols to sell, and you can buy tubs of the stuff, right? So you can actually buy it over the counter just from a health food store. Thought to be anti-aging drug, okay? I would much prefer if people ate a lot of fruit and vegetables and not just pick one compound because there are many related compounds like this in fruit and vegetables, okay, and nuts, etc. So picking just one compound and putting it in all your food, maybe not, but actually changing your diet so it's got more of the compounds like this will be better for you, okay? Another one which is coming out right now is capsaicin. That's the hot taste you find in chili peppers. There's evidence suggests that if you eat lots of chilies, it has an anti-diabetic effect. Okay? It may be because these, this capsaicin, what it actually does, it kills, selectively kills off certain neurons in your body, which control blood sugar levels. Okay? That doesn't sound like a very good thing to do, but that's exactly how they work. Okay? When you eat chili peppers, you will find that the first couple of times you eat them, they burn like crazy. Okay? But after a number of times you eat it, you have to have more and more chili to get the same effect. That's because it's killing off the nerve endings in your tongue. Yep. Okay, you have to have more present to have the same effect. Okay. Um, so chili, if you like spicy food, don't discourage it. But just don't eat 20 naan bread with your curry, okay, because that's high in carbohydrates. But chili is very good. Okay? And resveratrol is also very good as well. So these are a couple of things in your diet and lifestyle you can make, which are actually what's called a nutraceutical. So it's an active compound that you can actually take your cells, right, which may actually help as well in terms of managing, uh, managing diabetes, okay? So here's a couple of areas I'm interested in in my lab, personalized medicine. You see here, say, God, the human genome has been unraveled, damn hackers, I have to change the password. Well, <laughs> we're well past that time of knowing what the human genome is. We're now starting to understand what all those genes do. I showed you some gene names and how they may be effective. Uh, in pancreas function, but we're actually beginning to find out that depending on your genetic background, drugs may have different effects. Okay, for example, about 10 to 20 percent of you in this room have a certain common genetic variation that responds better to sulfonylurea drugs. Okay, that's not in the public domain so much now in terms of changing um, ideas of how we prescribe because we only published on that last year from my lab. Okay. So that's new research coming out, is looking at ways we can genotype you and find better drugs for you, okay, to work better for that particular individual. So that's going to be a new avenue for research for many drug companies interested in looking at your genetic background and you respond better to certain drugs, okay. And the other area of interest in my lab is looking at new targets to stimulate insulin secretion, so like the sulfonylurea drugs, but they don't cause hypoglycemia. We just published last year, um, actually this summer, in the journal Diabetes on a t new target for developing drugs which would not cause hypoglycemia. So we're actively pursuing that with a drug company in the States to develop new compounds. So maybe that's five, ten years away, but that's the kind of research that I do. So uh, with that, I'm happy to uh, take any questions. Thank you.